took me about 10 minutes at a military school to realize I am not the ideal soldier. Getting ready for a health screening before I started my journey as a new cadet, I was asked by a few soldiers to initial some health forms. So I did. CDT. Now immediately one of them calls out at me, that's not your rank, new cadet. Sign your initials. I was confused, but I did it. CDT. Now, there was a rule that first day that I was only supposed to answer questions with the answers, yes sir, no sir, I do not understand, or no excuses, and I wanted to follow the rules. So when they asked me what I was doing, I was honest. I do not understand. <laughs> Unfortunately, they also did not understand. <laughs> Eventually, after a long back and forth, they let me know that I didn't have to follow the response rule during the health screening, and we figured it out. Apparently, CDT is the abbreviation for cadet. My name is Carson David Taylor, CDT. Oh. Well, with that misunderstanding out of the way, I was ready to take on day one. And then they shaved my head. <laughs> Now, getting started today, I want to talk over two important notes. The first one is that last year I was formally diagnosed with autism. I started my college career at a military school and then transferred to Cornell, where I got diagnosed. It took me a while to accept that neurodiversity can be a part of me without determining my worth, and that's something that I want to talk about today. Neurodiversity refers to the natural differences in the ways our minds work from autism to ADHD and more. The second important fact is that I look great, bald. <laughs> Which I also found out that first day at boot camp. Now unfortunately, I did not get to enjoy my bald hair for very long, and I got sent through the typical gauntlet of military procedure. What I was supposed to do was march up to an older soldier, do a proper salute, and report with confidence. What I actually did was, in military terms, wrong. <laughs> See, my tone wasn't confident, the eye contact was painful, and my salute was weird. <laughs> what really got to me, though, was how foreign those things felt when I tried to fix them. The more times I tried to get them right, the more intense everything around me got. And by the time I actually finished the test, I was so disoriented that I moved into the wrong room. I met a roommate, made the bed, and then realized I had to go to a completely different room and do it all over again. Which is fine, because I'm pretty sure I made the first bed wrong. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that my first day was atypical, pun intended. But I had spent 18 years of my life building up a set of rules that worked for me at home. And my first day of boot camp, they all went out the window. And I was kind of frustrated that it took me so long to understand military procedure. So I committed myself then and there to developing a whole new set of rules and practicing them constantly. I mean, practice makes perfect, right? That was the ideology that led me to absolutely crush my role as a leaf in my kindergarten production of Jack and, Jack and the Beanstalk. So obviously it would work in the United States military. So, the first rule that I set for myself in that first semester was that I couldn't sleep in my bed. See, we had room inspections every day, and there were very strict standards for the way that your bed should be arranged and the precise angle at which the comforter should be put on the bed. Now, I was so worried that I would sleep in it, mess it up, and then make it wrong the next day and get my roommates punished that it was very difficult to sleep in that bed. So I slept on the floor and told myself I was doing it to toughen myself up for sleeping out in the field. Which, you know, sure. <laughs> so I slept on the floor, I pushed through discomfort, and I practiced my rules constantly. It would be one thing if all of that genuinely helped. Unfortunately, it did the exact opposite of help. The more I hyper-focused on those small things, the more effort and attention I put into things that made me feel uncomfortable and unnatural, the more I started to neglect the basic tasks that made a good squad mate, soldier, and person. When I threw away all of my rules for how to interact with people and deal with the world, I didn't know how to replace them. 
Now, by this point, you might be yelling at me in your head. Carson, you might say, problems with eye contact, sensory issues, hyper-focusing, and problems with tone? Obviously, by this point, you knew you were autistic, and you would be, in my earlier words, wrong. <laughs> See, a lot of people absolutely can't figure that type of thing out for themselves. But in my case, I needed to be guided there by a friend, and then a doctor, and then a second doctor, just in case the first friend, the doctor, and all the tests were wrong. But even getting the diagnosis came with its own set of challenges. See, when you get a diagnosis like that, it's tempting to use it to explain everything that's ever happened in your life. Like, oh, that's why eye contact is so difficult. That is why I have so much trouble with wrestling. That's why my kindergarten teacher moved my good behavior dolphin to the yellow warning zone. Everything makes sense now. But if you do that too much, you can tend to reduce your entire personality down to one factor. And if you identify as autistic, but associate autism exclusively with problems and mistakes, you're demonizing a part of yourself. Now, unfortunately, getting the diagnosis didn't actually convince me to accept myself. See, I interpreted the diagnosis as confirmation that there was something wrong with me, and I set to work trying to fix it. One part of autism can be that social interaction feels a bit unnatural, and that's something I can definitely understand. There's this concept called masking, which refers to the way that autistic people tend to hide their neurodivergent traits from others, and that's definitely something that I can relate to. See, for most of my life, social interaction felt just very unnatural, almost like I was playing a character. And, as my kindergarten class can attest, I am a great actor. <laughs> Ultimately, though, I had prepared a lot for the role. I mean, I had an entire notebook full of scripts and rules for social situations and facial expressions. For example, rule number one of laughing is that when you laugh, you have to close your eyes directly in proportion to how funny the thing is that you're laughing at. Otherwise, according to neurotypical people, it looks strange. <laughs> <laughs> But even when I set up my rules, when I got the diagnosis, they all felt dishonest all of a sudden. If I was putting on a mask, right, if I was imitating the way other people expressed affection or sadness when it wasn't natural to me, isn't that kind of like lying? No! But it was how I thought of it at the time. And so I threw out my entire rule book and I tried to convince myself to act as spontaneously as possible all of the time. Woof. But when I did that, when I was trying to be spontaneous, I was still modifying my behavior. I wasn't trying to look normal, but I was still trying to fit a model of what people might expect of me. I, I interpreted the diagnosis as a sort of accusation of dishonesty, and I responded to that diagnosis by trying to appear more honest rather than be more authentic. Now, after all my dramatic life changes, one thing became abundantly clear. It wasn't making me happy. I had tried scripting everything and then moved to complete improvisation, and the only thing I learned is that I am bad at improv. <clears throat> when I tried to make everything up on the go, it genuinely hurt. I realized that the common denominator was that I was setting rules not as guiding principles to make life easier, but as obstacles to make life harder. And they worked. All of my rules were set to try and minimize what I viewed as being autistic traits, because those were things that I felt like I had to fix. But that isn't true. When I tried to fix those things about myself, all I caused was misery. And if I genuinely wanted to be happy, I would have to learn how to appreciate the way my mind works. And there are a lot of good reasons to appreciate it. I mean, I genuinely like the way that I think. I agree with myself like 99% of the time. I think I make very good points. I also really enjoy the rules that I set for myself. They help me interact with others and reduce my stress. 
Ultimately, what I learned was that neurodiversity is a part of me, but that it doesn't determine my work. Now, the journey to self-acceptance does not have to be all awkward social interactions and pain. I mean, that's just describing middle school. <laughs> and yeah, sure, it is difficult to make realizations about yourself when you're hyper-focused on getting a 90-degree heel turn, right? But even if there are legitimate lessons to learn through that process, like you sleep in your bed, there is also a positive way to get there. For me, that came from prioritizing my environment shifting my focus away from policing my thoughts and towards developing comfortable spaces. Ultimately, self-acceptance doesn't have to be a lesson you learn through pain, and setting rules for your environment can be just as effective as setting them inside your head. Now, the first rule for my environment that really helped me was that we should find communities where we can exist without modifying ourselves. At Cornell, that community has been the autism social group a group where autistic students gather to discuss common issues and get to know each other. And it is amazing. I cannot tell you how incredible it is to have someone share a solution to a problem you've been unable to even describe for years. It's also awesome to sit around and complain about how sarcasm is hard to understand, which don't worry, it totally isn't. <laughs> but I do wish I could have gotten to that space earlier. See, at the military school, I had an entire group of people, a company, who was committed to my success and willing to let me know when I made mistakes, which, for the record, I made a perfectly reasonable amount of. But if I had gotten to that place earlier and reached out into my community, I could have gotten out of my own head. Now, I think it's clear, because of the way I acted at the military school, that just being in a community isn't enough. And that's what brings us to our second rule that we should share our thought process with people we trust. Honestly, sharing your thought process can be incredibly liberating, because just going over your thoughts, expressing it to another person, and getting a second opinion can be just what you need to give yourself some perspective. I mean, can any of you imagine what it would have been like if I had explained to my roommates why I was sleeping on the floor? I barely understand it, and I literally am me. But I was so stuck inside my own head that I didn't reach out to the communities and people that might have shown me where my thought process was going wrong. Now, I spent years policing my thoughts and the ways that I made decisions. But when I did that, I became less compassionate and less happy. I thought that I had to restrict my rules to restrict myself in order to get better. And I was stuck inside my head. But the best way out when you're stuck inside your head is to reach out into your environment. Try and find community and build trust. Because regardless of what makes us unique, it is critical that we accept our differences if we ever want to accept ourselves as people. I, I honestly believe now that it is possible to accept those parts of yourself that matter. Because I know that being autistic doesn't make me any worse. It is a part of me that matters. Because when you're in a room full of people who also have autism, you realize the other things about yourself that matter. And when you find those things, you realize that autism is one of them. That it is a part of you that matters. It is a part of you that is valuable. And it is a part of you that you can celebrate. Now, Neurodiversity is a universal topic, not least of all because no two minds work in the same way. We all experience the world differently, and that's good. So whatever your uniqueness, your differences are, please reach out when you need it. I thought for so long that I was autistic and that that meant that I had to do things a certain way. I thought that it was a part of me that I had to fix. I thought I had good traits and bad autistic traits, and the only way forward was to minimize autism as much as I could. I was so worried about being alone that I hid myself from others, but I realized in my communities that the best defense against isolation is genuine self-expression. And I know now that neurodiversity is a part of me, but that it does not determine my worth. I have good traits, I have bad traits, and I'm autistic, and I look great.
Ball. 